Okay. Um, hello. Um, good to be here. My name's Chris Enso. I won't try and explain what my job is. It's far too hard. Uh, when I try to explain it to my kids, and I've been trying to do that now for the last 10 years, halfway through they go, don't bother Dad. I'm, you know, life's too short. Um, so I'll just kind of crack on with the presentation. I was going to do two things today, really. I was going to give you some tools, or hopefully t let you take away some tools that um, will A, help keep yourselves safe as people who use cyberspace, but also people, I want you to help me to protect your organization by taking away some of the tools I give you and maybe asking questions in whatever department you come from as to you know, how good is your cyber security within your organization. So what I thought I'd do to start with is I would kick off um, with a little bit of history of, of GCHQ. So we're almost 100 years old. Uh, in 2019, we'll have our 100th birthday. We may get a telegram, you never know. Um, we were started just after, we, we sort of officially formed just after the First World War. And it was recognized during the First World War that the people who were making codes to protect um, our information at the time were not talking to the people who were breaking the codes. And after the war, they kind of decided to have a bit of a partnership because when they gave the codes that we were making to protect information to the guys breaking it, they found that it was quite, hard, quite easy to break. So from that point on, it was felt that you have to take, keep security and intelligence together. And that's really what it's been like for the last um, 92, 93 years, apart from a little bit in the 50s where um, the security bit and the intelligence bit kind of went their separate way, with the security bit joining up with the post office. So we've got quite a long history, um, but I think all I'd ask you to take from it is the fact that we do security and intelligence in the same organization, two missions, um, and there's only another about four or five organizations around the world that do something similar and that brings a huge amount of strength for, from both sides of the organization so when I joined so I joined in um, 1989 and it was all about communication security and it actually what we did had been about communication security since the First World War so that history went back an awful long way it was all about um, developing the equipment that would protect, say, the Prime Minister talking to the US President or the Prime Minister talking to ambassadors around the world. So it's very much about how do we protect that communications, very much around Morse still um, and very much around radio. When I joined the organization, um, there were these new things called computers that had been around a long time, but they were only just beginning to um, sort of be used in a, in a, on, a, in a, on a much broader scale. So I, I was so privileged, I suppose, when I look back to join a small group of people, which was about eight strong, and we were looking at these new things called computer security, or CompuSec, um, as we used to call them. And when I look back to 1989, um, it's quite, that time was quite pivotal for a couple of reasons. So first reason was that this chap um, was around. This is a chap called Clifford Stoll. He was a, um, an, an astronomer originally, but he became a system administrator for Lawrence Livermore, one of the, one of the university labs um, over in the States. And he noticed a discrepancy in the accounting program. So the way that the computers used to work, you had big mainframes, and everybody used to buy some time on the mainframes. So they had to pay for the time they used. And they had two accounting programs, um, and there was a 75 cents difference in the two accounting programs. And as an astronomer and a scientist, this didn't compute. Um, so he spent quite a bit of his time trying to understand what the discrepancy was. And that took him on a journey that ended up in um, East Germany, as it was then, and a bunch of hackers that were being paid by the KGB to steal things from what was the predecessor of the internet called ARPANET. Um, and he wrote a book that was published around 1988 called The Cuckoo's Eggs, thoroughly recommended as a read. Nothing's changed. You know, despite that was, you know, nearly, what was it, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, um, very little has changed. The technology's changed, but actually the way that things were being attacked in those days has not changed. And I was reading through his book the other day just to remind myself, and he had an interesting quote in this. So just remember, this is 1989. Ten years later, um, Microsoft launched Windows 98. And it became, if you like, one of the most, you know, the, the ubiquitous operating system of its time. And because of that, what you see in, the, in sort of 99, 2000, 2001, 2002 is what some people call the golden age of viruses. Because, because of the widespread use of Windows 98 meant that those, those viruses could spread quite widely. So his, his, his sort of prophecy that he wrote in, in 1988 very much came true. And the other thing that happened then was this chap came along. 
Um, and his name is Robert Morris. And Robert Morris was the author of the first proper internet worm that ran around ARPANET, which is the sort of predecessor of the internet. Um, and it was the first real kind of worm that did, some, did, did, did a lot of damage, taking down a lot of the ARPANET. And the ironic thing was that his father, which was um, Rob, um, Robert Morris Sr., was the chief scientist for the National Computer Security um, Organization within the US at the time. So that was, you know, slightly ironic that the, the guy who launched the first major worm, his father was actually responsible for a lot of security and had actually designed the Unix operating system. So um, we did computer security for a while, CompuSec, but we suddenly realized that actually it wasn't the computers we wanted to secure because that was quite easy because you could lock them in a room or lock them in a drawer, or whatever you wanted to do with them. Actually, it was the information that we actually wanted to secure. It was the information that these computers held. So we then invented a new term called InfoSec. Um, so what do I mean by information? So let's think about information for a minute. So, this is, for me, the first thing that I think about when I think about information. And there may be some surprises on here. Um, so when I use this slide in other venues, people say video, is that information? Telephone calls, is that information? Well, yeah, most of that stuff now is digital. So it's ones and zeros that goes down the line. So that is all information. Um, you could almost say today that, you know, you go back 100 years and we couldn't survive without food and water. I'd, I'd argue today that, especially in the Western world, that we can't survive without information now, because it's information that means that we get food and water. And, and you know, this, this, this diagram really explains it. Um, information makes all that happen. It generates power. It passes that power through the grid. It, it purifies water. It moves water around, around the, the, the system. Um, it manufactures things. Money is now information. So information, we are now highly, highly dependent on it. And the interesting thing here, and there's a number of PhDs that could be written on this, is what is the interrelationship between all these various systems? So for example, electricity is only pumped around by the telecom system. Um, the telecom system needs electricity to be able to um, operate. There's, a, there's an interesting chicken and egg there. If you take out the electricity, do you still have telecoms? If you take out telecoms, do you still have electricity? And how do the two things interrelate? Answers on a postcard, but it, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing to see the interrelationship of that sort of critical infrastructure. Let's think about value of information. So we've talked about information, let's think about value. Now, um, I did this exercise with a group of uh, 14, 16 year olds last week, and they were pretty good actually at valuing things. So the first one was quite easy, because um, that's 20 quid, of course it's 20 quid. The next thing, um, anybody like to guess what the value of an iPod is at the moment? Oh, 100 pounds. Well, I'll, go, I'll split the difference. So it's about 140. So these are Amazon's best prices yesterday when I was looking at it. Um, let's look at something else. That's um, an iPad and a Galaxy, Sam, Samsung Galaxy. Any, any offers? 400. 400, do I have an advance? 500, I'll take that. That was 500. So that's what you're talking about there. Um, finally, because um, my finger is on the pulse, an Xbox One, how much does that cost? No. Nope. Any, what was the last one? 400, it was 430. And I was really amazed. So these 14 to 16 year olds knew exactly what that stuff was valued at. Um, they, they practically got them all right. Um, and knowing that value um, is quite good because you know, you know, if I lose it, if I damage it, how much it's gonna cost me. You know, for the, for the things that cost, so 140 quid for the iPod, would I bother taking out insurance on it? Probably not, because it would probably cost me as much to, to replace it. Um, would I take some insurance out on, on the iPad or the Galaxy? Well, I might, um, because of the value of it. So they're fairly easy things, and this is the next thing I challenge them with. How much is that worth? Um, Hmm, interesting question. So it depends, doesn't it, of course. So um, 99p, if that's an iTunes download. I did ask them, how many of you um, pay for your music these days? Put your hands up. It was quite a quiet room at that moment. Um, or it could be 5 million, 5 billion, whatever, because that could be a bit of IP that is really, really valuable. But it's really, really hard to put an estimate on it, because where does it exist? And I'm quite old-fashioned, so I'm, you know, I still buy CDs. Um, I'm sorry to say, mainly because I like doing them in alphabetical order and you know, stacking them on the shelves, they look nice. Um, but why I like CDs is because for me they are tangible. 
I have something, I've bought something, I own something, and I can you know, wave it around, I can put it in alphabetical order or whatever. Um, that's not tangible, those ones and noughts, or is not as tangible to me. So I did, a, before I, I did this, I, I tested this on my daughter. So I said to my daughter, um, where's your music? And she said, it's in my iPod. I said, okay, what happens when you lose your iPod? Where's your music? She said, it's, it's at iTunes. I said, okay, what happens when iTunes goes bust? Where's your music? And you can begin to see her realize that she doesn't quite know where it is. Because I could point to mine because it was in the corner in a big pile of CDs. She couldn't point to hers. Um, I have a similar thing with photographs. You know, I worry where all my photographs are now. And I worry in 15, 20, 30 years' time, will I still be able to access them? Because have I got the right hardware, the right software? You know, what will I be able to do? My hard copies all sit under the stairs in a box. And so occasionally I'll go and have a look and pull them all out and, 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 and have a look at them. And I don't have to worry about it, apart from if the house burns down, but I'll have other things to worry about then. But I kind of know where they are. They are tangible. So it gives us an interesting dilemma as to how we value these things. So let's look at another thing. So that's much about confidentiality, if you like, and, and sort of what, what would it cost me if I lose these things. Let's think about something a little bit more intangible again. So medical records. Um, we've all now got, well, most of us have probably got electronic medical records. What are they worth? Um, well, from a confidentiality perspective, you know, insurance companies, people like that might be really interested in them. But think about the integrity of them. So all of those records will have our blood groups on them. Um, so what are we prepared to, to accept as an error rate in that case? So if you think of a bank, so a bank will accept 3 to 5% fraud rate on transactions, 3 to 5%. Because they know they can either insure themselves against it or they'll just build it into their business model to, to recoup it. If you take um, medical records, so 60 million medical records, what's the, what's, the, you know, what's the error rate we're prepared to accept? So lots of people say to me, well, go and talk to the banks. You know, the banks know how to do this stuff. They know how to manage information. They know how to value information. Okay, if I take the bank model, that gives me a 3 to 5% error rate. So let me do some sums. So 60 million people in the UK, let's go for a 5% error rate. Okay, that's Sheffield. So if I change the blood group, um, or if you randomly change the blood group of 5% of medical records, you know, that could potentially kill the number of people in Sheffield. If you go for 1%, it's something like the men in Reading. So they are very, very big numbers. And I think this is where we start to move from um, information security to information assurance because some of these things you know if you're a bank you insure yourself against losses in some areas you just cannot insure yourself because it the loss is so big or the, the you know the loss is so bad that you actually want to make sure it doesn't happen in the first place and that's where we started to use the term information assurance because we want assurance in the first place that bad things are going to happen my only criticism of information assurance is that up until now we've had some really good short forms so comsec CompuSec, InfoSec, InfoArse. <laughs> Doesn't quite ring as well, does it? But that said, what it's all about is being really confident that, and it's, it, you know, it, that, that you are actually managing your risk. You are protecting yourself properly. Um, and it's not just about doing some security stuff, because it's bigger than that. So that's kind of where we got to information assurance, because at the end of the day, there are some bad things that could happen that we really, really don't want to happen. So we want assurance up front that they're not going to happen, not insurance afterwards, because actually you just can't cover these things. So what do I mean by information assurance? So I use a very simple model. This is not rocket science, I can guarantee you. So the first part of information assurance is risk management. Understanding your risk, understanding what information you have, what assets you have, understanding what the threat is to those assets, you know, who's out, how could they be damaged in some way, and that could be intentional or, or, or by accident. Now, risk by their definition, and I know this because I've looked it up, um, can happen sometimes. So you need some contingency planning, um, continuity planning, resilience planning, whatever you want to call it. But it's that preparation for the worst. And when I look at contingency planning that organizations have, they have lots of stuff in terms of what if we can't get onto site because it's snowing, uh, what happens if we've got no water, what if we've got no electricity, all those kind of things. Um, but not often what do we do if we get a virus in, come into the organization. No contingency planning in that space, yet that is as critical as, as, as some of the other things they consider. The other thing about risk management is, as again, risks may happen. Being aware of when that risk has come to be realized or the risk has changed in some way is really important because the quicker you can spot it, the quicker you can reduce the impact. So some sort of situation awareness to detect what's happening is really important. 
Then incident management, responding it to, quick, to it quickly, having the skills to do that. So from um, a CSG GCHQ perspective, um, we, what we, we look at, so we monitor the GSI for intrusion, so people attacking the GSI, and we've done that now for the last 10 years. So I was involved in, in setting that system up. We do it under DPA and with the, with the owner's permission. Um, but it's all about how can we spot things happening, you know, intrusions coming into the, into the, um, the GSI. And what we find is that when we see it, we, we see it go into the GSI and then we see it go into a department. And we might ring a department up and say, by the way, we've just seen this going on within your organisation. You may want to look at it. And I think on one occasion, they gave us um, an incident number to say, we'll get back to you when, when, when we've got some time. And it's like, well, we don't care. You know, at the end of the day, it's your organisation. It's your information. You need to decide what you're going to do about it. But having the right skills to be able to do that is really important. And I don't think we've always got them um, to be able to do that. So then there's incident investigation. So why did it go wrong in the first place? A lot of the time organizations, public or private, um, just want to get rid of it. They want to find out what went wrong. Well, they want to just get it out of the system so they can carry on working. Often they don't want to know why did this happen and get some feedback into the system so that you can adapt, adjust the way you do your risk management, adjust the way you do your contingency planning. So because they don't do that, it happens time and time again. So within your organization, you know, what is your contingency planning look like? Do you have a feedback loop that when an incident happens, that it, it's investigated and it's fed back into the system in the first place? Go ask some difficult questions around that. So to summarize information assurance, it's, it's the protect, it's the prepare, it's the detect and respond. And for me, it's all about, I mean, it's, it's not, yes, it's about confidentiality, integrity, availability, maintaining all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about how do you reduce risk and harm to information and information systems? Simple as that. Managing your risk, responding quickly when something happens, and being able to, to feed back in and learn from what happens. So take four things from what I'm saying here. So the first thing is, whenever you hear the term information assurance, um, it, what we're talking about is a methodology, a process that an organization applies to manage its risk. I'm quite often said, or asked if I can manage somebody's risk for them because it's quite hard, and it is quite a hard thing to do. Um, and I say, okay, I'll, I'll manage your risk. Do you have an internet connection? They say, yes. So I'll get a big cable cutters and I'll go and cut their cable because if they want me to manage their risk, that's the way I do it. I go for risk averseness because I know where I come from. But that's not for me to do. It's an essential business a tool having access to the internet, so it's the organization itself needs to do that management. It has to be the organization's choice. So it's, it's carried out by the information owner. The interesting thing about an information owner is sometimes as an organization, you might have a load of information, but it may not be yours. It may be your customers. Um, so are they happy with the way you're managing their information? You know, that's quite an interesting problem as well. And what we're really talking about is, is reducing risk by reducing vulnerabilities. Let's go back to the Second World War. And the main means of communication through the Second World War was high-frequency radio. So Morse code doo -doo -doo -doo, um, around the world. The great thing about the HF is it bounces all over the place. So you can send something from here, and it'll end up in Australia if the ionosphere is done and the physics are all right. So that means anywhere in the world, you can shove an aerial up, and you can pick up that radio wave. So that's the vulnerability in it. Now, you could, you could tackle that problem in two ways. The first way is that you're going to bomb every aerial site that exists around the world, but you can't find them all. There's too many of them. So you have to tackle the vulnerability. So you tackle the vulnerability by um, encrypting the traffic so that nobody can read it. So you don't care where it's being read. They can't actually understand it. And that's very similar with the internet today. Now, at the end of the day, there are millions, I don't know how many servers sit out there, how many endpoints that are out there that are all potentially hostile, that can all potentially use their access to the internet and organization systems to actually compromise them in some way. You can't take them all out. But what you can do is reduce your tax surface, reduce their ability to get into your system. And finally, we've got, we've got cyber security. Um, this isn't anything new as far as I'm concerned. Government connected to the internet in 97. I know because I was involved in the building of the GSI. Um, three or four years later, we were beginning to see sort of attacks against those systems um, on, the, on the GSI. So we've been involved in cyberspace now for coming up 15, 16 years. Um, so we have been not battling cyberspace, but certainly understanding the risks and trying to do something about that, the security of cyberspace. So mainly what I'm going to talk about is going to be technical, but don't run away just yet. 
Um, but before I do that, I just want to really, really emphasize that it's not all about technical stuff. Um, Information is mostly used by people. Systems are mostly used by people. And this is just a few um, snippets from the, um, the Biz um, Breaches Survey. Uh, you know, 36% of worst breaches caused by user error, 36%. So you have to look at this problem holistically. Because I like techie stuff, I'm just going to do the techie stuff today. But that's what you have to consider, the whole thing. So bugs and features. I'm now going to tell you a secret. I'm sure this hall's been swept and nobody else is listening. Um, so the secret is, all right, it's not that much of a secret, but maybe we forget today how complicated computers are because they are the swans, aren't they? You know, they're graceful, they're colorful, well, they're not that colorful a swan, but they're, you know, they, you know, they look seamless. They look as if you know, they work and you know, go back 10 years and blue screen of death for those of you who remember, you know, they, they were always breaking and you, know, you couldn't get the applications to work and nothing would move between them, but they have come on. But they are still complicated underneath. Um, how complicated are they? Well, here's, here's some work I did. So here's some well-known um, applications, pieces of software. And these are the figures I could, I could get for the numbers of lines of code. So if there's any software programmers in the audience, and I say lines of code, you all go, oh, you can't measure it that way because it's far more complicated. And you're right, it is. But if we accept 25% error or even 50% error, that is a lot of lines of code. So Apple IOX is 86 million lines of code. That's a huge number of, 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 of lines of code. And especially when you consider this little piece of research, which was done about um, four or five years ago, that looks at um, errors per thousand lines of code. So the average is 15 to 50 per thousand lines of code. Um, Microsoft is lower than that, and there is a reason for that. So Microsoft is lower because, you know, I talked about the golden age of viruses back in 2000, 2001, 2002. In 2001, or it might be 2002, Bill Gates wrote a memo. Bill Gates' memos are quite famous. You can go and read them on the internet. And he basically said, we can't go on like this. We cannot go on um, building software that is full of bugs that get compromised so easily. We have to fix it. And I had the pleasure in, in about 2001, 2002, going to the States and going to Seattle and going to what they call, I think, the war room. The war room was where all these really, really clever and innovative people from the various development teams within Microsoft came together to, um, to discuss about how they could make Microsoft products even better next time round. These great ideas to do this and do this and do this. Um, and it was, you know, it was a great buzz of, of innovation and, and ideas and creativity. And then the doors would open and the room would fall, fall, fall silent as the security team walked in. Um, and the security team would walk up with, their arm, with an armful of paper and they'd go, this is really interesting stuff, great that you're being innovative, but can you fix that first? Can you fix that first? Can you fix that first? And it's not just fixing, it's regression testing. It's testing that all the applications still work and all the bits fit together. So that was the reason at that point that you were doing so much regression testing and, and bug fixing that you weren't taking the product forward anymore. So it starts to hit the bottom line. And that's where Bill Gates said enough is enough. And they did a huge amount of work in re-engineering um, the sort of Windows operating system, the Windows code base. And that is reflected in that statistic there where, you know, the Microsoft applications are down at the 10 and 20 per thousand. Still quite a few, but, you know, they're far better than, than the other stuff. Now, does this matter? And, you know, are people aware of it? Well, yes, they are aware of it because if you read the warranty for any software, it's that thing that's a thousand pages long and in, you know, you know eight, eight point um, font, um, it'll say that. And I've gone through lots and lots of bits of software to see, you know, what they say. And largely, most of the stuff I look at, the software isn't warranted to work. One of the warrants I looked at said, this software is warranted to work largely as is for the first 90 days. Not sure what it'll do after that. Can you imagine buying a car that had that warranty? The brakes will work substantially for the first 90 days as is. After that, well, I don't know. But, but we also, I mean, I sign up to this stuff because I want the software. I want to do stuff. I want games. I want, you know, I want to do things. So I will sign up to it and I'll accept it. And we all do. Um, but the problem is that won't improve things. So, you know, does, do bugs really matter is probably the next thing you'd, you'd ask. Well, maybe not, but maybe they do. So here's a, a graph. So on average, you look at every year, something like 4,000 bugs are discovered and published. 4,000 bugs are published. 
That doesn't include the ones that aren't published. No idea how many they are, but 4,000 bugs per year are published. And there's an interesting graph because I think it's the, uh, yeah, it's the orange line is the operating systems line. So as you can see, that's quite low now. If you'd gone back to oh, I don't know, 2005, that would have been at the top, guarantee it. But now what it is, they've locked the operating systems down, but the code that we run on top of it, the applications, the software, the web apps, all that kind of thing, is full of holes because it's not been properly tested. We know how to engineer good code. We've been, you know, there, there are lots and lots of university courses on things like that. But at the end of the day, if the market doesn't care because it signs the warranties to say, yeah, I'm happy, then we continue to have those bugs in it. And whilst we have those bugs in it, we will continue to be um, exposed to attack from, from cyberspace. And I think that, that's, the, that's the real challenge. Here's a, I think, probably, so here's a little bit of a, a sort of a, a story of a vulnerability. So this was a vulnerability in Adobe Acrobat and, and Flash Player. Um, it starts, uh, well, it starts being picked up in, in early April last year or the year before, 2011. And when it first gets picked up, it's called a zero day because nobody knows about it. I think if you, if you read about Stuxnet, for example, which was the thing that, that, went, that allegedly went after sort of Iranian enrichment, um, I think there was about four zero days. These are gold, and I'll show you how much gold dust zero day vulnerabilities are. So these are things that nobody knows about. So they first, somebody finds this, you know, somebody finds a new vulnerability, somebody finds a way of exploiting it. After a while, and that can be quite a long while, it gets picked up by somebody. So one of the antivirus vendors or whatever get hold of it, and they have a look at it, and they start to develop signatures around it. So the first hump, um, I don't know where this has got a pointer. Um, so the first hump you see, the red blue, is, is kind of where the signatures have been deployed, and they're beginning to see it. They're beginning to know, what, know what's going on. Um, then over time, you see not much action, but they've now updated Adobe Player, so there's new releases out there. But what's going on with that blue, that flat blue line, is that, that, that's been reverse engineered. There are clever people out there working out where the hole was. So why did they reissue this patch? Why did they reissue this patch? Why did they reissue this software? There was a hole in it. So um, they've gone to look for that, and then all of a sudden you get the green stuff, which is where um, lots of people now are beginning to exploit that vulnerability. This vulnerability was largely used in its early days to compromise, um, I think it was um, charities, world charity organizations was the first place it was used. Another place it was used, there was a, Mandian, a, a company called Mandian produced a report on, on, on some of the threats they were looking at. And this vulnerability was used to repack it, was used in a repackaging of that report um, that people were reading to find out how they were being attacked, and the report itself attacked them, or, or a repackaging of that report using this, using this vulnerability. Now, I talked about being, being gold dust. Um, this is the value. These are what vulnerabilities will, um, you can sell for in the black market. Um, again, the McAfee figures, I, I don't know, I, I, I won't you know, put my hand on that, that's what it is, but it's, you know, if you said 50% of that, it's a lot of money. So these are for zero days. Those things right at the beginning of the graph, when nobody else knows about them, that's how much they, they cost under the sort of cybercrime umbrella because they are so valuable because with a zero day, you can do lots of things because so they don't exist. Antivirus doesn't know about them. There are no patches for them. So you can do a huge amount of things with a zero day. And that's what it costs. So, you know, it's a business now. There is a business around doing, doing this sort of thing. So let me just talk you through a cyber attack, just, just in sort of really high level terms. So the first part of a cyber attack is really about reconnaissance. So you've got a system, could be your home PC, could be your phone, right? It's connected to the internet in some way. So people will be looking for, you know, how's it set up, what operating system you're using, what have you got, you know, what sort of, they're looking for holes and ways into it. Um, once they find a way in, or potential way in, then they look at how do they deliver it. So delivery can be one of a number of ways. So first delivery is I could just connect to your computer. So imagine you're sitting at home, you've got a computer on the kitchen table, um, it's on the internet. Potentially, if you haven't got a firewall, we'll come back to that later, you know, I could connect directly to your computer and I could start using your computer without you knowing it. Another way I could do it, so I could send you an email with a, an attachment, a Word document, an Excel spreadsheet, Adobe document, whatever it happens to do, PDF. Um, and inside that document, there's a way of, of exploiting a particular vulnerability on your system. Um, so you could do that. I could send you an email that says, there's a really great thing at this, at this web link, go click it. And you click the web link, and it pulls down some malicious code onto your, your computer. 
So there are different ways that you can actually get onto that box. I could even give you a USB stick. Go plug that in somewhere or send you a CD. You know, there are a number of ways you can deliver these things into a system. So, you know, many of you will be probably pulling your hair out because you haven't got USB access to your computers in work. Well, the reason you haven't is that because that's a way in which this stuff gets into systems. And once it's in the system, often it, inv it, it evades a lot of the border controls we have. Once it's in the system, it's really hard to get out. So that's the next thing. So then you've got exploitation. So this is where that vulnerability we just talked about really comes into it. This is where you, know, you can really um, get into the system. And if you're running as an administrator, and we'll come back to what that means in a minute. If you're running as an administrator, you can do what the hell it likes. You can do the same thing that you can do on that computer, basically. And its main objective will be to become you on that computer. Whilst it's kind of acting illegally, so it's, it's in there with some odd code, you know, it can be spotted, you know, antivirus will spot it, whatever. But if it can become you and, and know your password and your credentials, then how do you spot it then? And within an organization, it's really hard. Once a malicious um, sort of attacker becomes a legitimate user, it's really quite hard to spot them. So you really don't want them to get to that stage. You really want to sp spot them much earlier. There's a command and control element. So once you're in there, once you've got a bridgehead within the computer, then you want to command and control it to do things for you. So if you think of viruses, a lot of the viruses you see are very, in many ways, dumb because they land on your computer and they'll do something and they'll replicate themselves and send, them off, send themselves off somewhere else. Um, what these are about is doing a lot more. They can you know, list your directories, turn things on and off, turn your, anti, turn your, your, your spyware, uh, turn your antivirus off, turn your firewall off. It'll look like it's still on, but they can turn it off. So there's lots of things they can do there that, in other words, um, allows them to, to stay there and develop their, their presence on your computer or your computer system, depending how big it is. And then it comes down to exploitation. What are they going to do? So most cases we've seen, which has been largely publicized, is stealing IP. So we see an awful lot of IP theft from, from UK companies to the point where we produced with beers and cabinet office uh, the 10 steps to cybersecurity. This was our attempt to try and get companies to think about loss of IP, the value of information to them. Um, but if you look then, so that's a stealing thing, sort of confidentiality issue. But then if you look at Aramco and, the, and what happened in Saudi, um, that was a, a company that lost, I think it, it, it basically destroyed 60,000 PCs, 60,000 computers. So that wasn't a confidentiality issue, that was an availability issue. So, you know, depending what they, how they want to exploit it, and they can do all those things, but it's a similar sort of methodology that they, that they adapt. So here's a few simple things that you can do. None of this is rocket science. And I'd like you to think about this in two ways. First of all, from your own personal perspective, you've got computers at home, your children, you know, kids have got computers at home. Um, some basic things you can do to make them safe. But I also want you to think as, as, as working in government and working for government organization or the public sector, wherever you work, to be more challenging in terms of why are we not using the most up-to-date software? Have we really got our systems patched? Now, use some of this stuff to make your systems better. We all have a part to play in managing information risk within our organizations. You know, part of that, part of what you can do is to kind of poke your, if there's any system admins or, you know, people who run the IT, sorry, you know, but you need to go and, and you know, ask them why we haven't got some of this stuff. Why aren't we working in this way? So, so that we keep challenging, that we get this stuff fixed. So the first thing is, um, so these icons, so whatever operating system you run, whether it's Android, whether it's Apple, whether it's Windows, has got automatic updates on it now. Didn't used to, but today it has automatic updates. Don't turn it off and make sure it's turned on because that's the thing that makes sure your system is patched. Patching is like um, vaccination. You know, if you get vaccinated for something, and it doesn't matter how many people you come into contact with who might have a particular disease or, or whatever, um, you don't catch it. Once you're patched, once you've patched your system, got the latest software on it, you're immune. They can send as much as they like at you. But at the end of the day, if it's, if it's been patched, it doesn't affect you. So keep your systems patched. And you know, when you're in the office, why are your systems not being patched? Ask the question. Antivirus, really, really important. Um, I had one experience, uh, five or six years ago, 
The fact that they didn't renew their antivirus software, which would cost about £1,000 for the organisation, cost them about £15 million to clean up the event that could have been stopped if they'd had antivirus. Not pushing any particular version of antivirus, all I'm saying is get some reputable antivirus out there. There's plenty of magazines and, and comparison sites, go look at it, but make sure you've got antivirus. If you're an organisation, you should have it at the boundary and you should have it on every box. And preferably different, different versions of antivirus because, you know, it's not all perfect, but together they complement each other. Firewalls. Having a firewall, most antivirus products come with firewalls. They tend to, be, um, tend to be bundled together. And a lot of operating systems now come with firewalls. Firewalls are the thing that kind of stop me connecting directly to your computer. Because I can only connect on ports that the firewall allows. Make sure it's switched on. Make sure it's configured. Most of them are automatically done these days. So you don't have to think about it too much. But make sure you've got one. Make sure it's switched on. System admin. So all of the um, main operating systems can run into sort of two modes. One is, one is admin, one is user. So on my home computers, I do not run as administrator. So if when you log in to your home computer, you have one account, which is your admin account, and that's how you do all your work, um, only use that for upgrade, up, uploading software and things like that. Do not use it for working normally. Create user accounts and use your user account to do that. Why? Because administrator, you can do the hell you like on that box. If you're compromised as an administrator, it basically means that software acts as the administrator then and can do it likes. If, it's, if you're compromised as a user, it's limited to what it can do. So do not be an administrator. Be the user in your home computers. Most organizations should have this, um, sus but you know, it's a test. My final piece of advice is around um, social networking and, and cybernet in general, cyberspace in general. It's not really a pearl of wisdom, but pearls grow from small things, and they grow and grow over the years. And the longer that you are on, the longer you are on the internet, the bigger your your personality becomes on the internet, your avatar on the internet becomes, and you will have no control over that avatar. Whatever you put there, you sometimes think it's only you reading it, but actually it's being grabbed by lots and lots of different people, and it create and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I try and keep my own profile quite low but it is getting harder and harder to do that. Um, so here's a website that um, collects stuff on me. Nothing to do with me, this website. It's got at least 29 entries. There are at least three Crescensors in the UK, and they've managed to differentiate us. So I don't know whether this is purely machine-driven or whether there are people sitting behind us doing that analysis. But every time I give a presentation, so I'll have another entry as a result of today, if my name ends up in the, in the program, um, goes onto that website. I have no control over it. Um, so how many things are out there that, that are about, you know, for many people it doesn't matter. And if I'm not standing here preaching, you mustn't use social networking, you mustn't do that, you mustn't do that. it's up to you at the end of the day. What you have to realise is that what you put out could be there a very, very long time and you may not be able to stop it or to, to, to change it or to, to delete it. So just be aware of what you're doing. And as when, you know, as a citizen, as a, as a, as a you know, as a citizen in the UK, but also within a department. When you're in a department more so, because, um, you know, when you're tweeting or whatever about what the department's doing, people are reading that and they are seeing it as the department. So you just have to be conscious about what you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, when I see, you know, what, what um, footballers or whatever say on Twitter. You know, you think, why have they said that? Do they think that what they're typing is a personal diary that only a few friends can see? You know, what is the... I do not understand... I, I really can't get my head around the... Um, sort of how you get to that position where you're putting that sort of stuff out. But, you know, it's everyone to their own. Um, I'm careful. I try to be careful what I put out. All I ask you is to think about the risk and what you're putting out there and how that might be used against you. That's the thing I think you need, you need to really consider. That's the end of what I was going to talk about. I just want to finish with a short video from my colleagues in Get Safe Online. So as I said, this, this talk is trying to do two things. One is give you a few tools that within your organisation you can ask the right questions but also as a, um, you know, as a person using the internet with your own computers, um, there's an organization called Get Safe Online. I thoroughly recommend you, you go look at it because it gives you lots of advice on how you can protect yourselves. A lot of it good stuff for when you're in the department. So I'll finish with um, this video.
So, now, as I say, it's about, you, it's, it's, it's your decisions how you manage your risk. When you're in an organization, the organization kind of sets what the risk is they're prepared to take in terms of, of information. When you're at home, that's your choice. But be informed, understand what the risks are, and make those choices wisely. Thank you. So I think we get some questions now, possibly. Five minutes. Does anybody have any easy questions? Oh, gentleman here, has anybody got, there's a mic somewhere. Usually the furthest end of the room. Right. You showed us there, it was a good demonstration of maybe going overboard to secure your laptop. But if you're working for a government organization, you may, you may as, well as well put that amount of security on it because the, the antivirus and security software that's on a machine means that every time I open my laptop, it takes me 15 minutes to get into it to go through all the different security processes. So I'm just hoping that in the future now that we do have a level of security, but quicker to access some of the material that we've got on the systems. Also, with the hardware that we're given, we're given very good smartphones as part of work, very good laptops, but a lot of the functionality that would allow us to do our jobs more efficiently have been turned off. Again, are there going to be ways in the future which could combat that and let us use our technology to its best potential? So exactly know what you mean. Um, we have our own systems. Um, Security is often put up as this is the reason why this is so rubbish. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I talked about software development not being as good as it could be. System development, system integration, system delivery is also not as good as it should be. And the way we procure things are nowhere near as good as they should be in terms of IT. A lot of the problems that you have is often, oh, it's security. Go read the contracts sometimes. Sometimes the contracts actually mandate things that make those things happen. You know, um, there was one contract, I mean, we're, part of my job is, is I'm looking at how do you raise the bar in terms of professionalization, not just for security specialists, but everybody else in, in terms of security. And procurement is a particularly interesting area. Um, we've seen contracts that say, we want 99.999% availability and we want you to patch your systems. You can't do that, they're mutually ex exclusive. We've seen contracts that specify the operating system the browser, the version of the browser. So how long is this system going to be running for? It's going to be running for five years maybe, maybe 10 years in some organizations. No flexibility. And over time, they're going to get slower and slower. The contracts don't often have, have upgrades to them. So you're using software that is even the security software, which is quite old, and we have this experience ourselves. Having enough good security products out there is really important. The problem is that the model we have is very much commercially driven. So um, we need commercial products to be brought forward to, to get some assurance around them, because at the end of the day, you don't know what a commercial product does. Um, and getting enough vendors through the door that give us the really slick products, the really you know, stuff that, 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 that is quick and, 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 um, and works um, is a challenge. But we need to address it, absolutely need to address it. Um, can we get some of the more Gucci features turned on? For the end of the day, it's a department's risk management decision. You have CIROs, each department is a senior information risk owner. Um, it's that, you know, they can make decisions on behalf of the department. It's more complicated than that, because it always is, because there's a lot of shared services now. So one department deciding it has a very low risk, it has a very high risk, low risk. So anyway, it's prepared to take a load of risks. Um, if that's connected to the GSI, for example, then that's putting other departments at risk. So it's, a, you know, but when it's something that the organization can decide to do, it's up to the organization to make those risks, to take those or manage or accept those risks. Something I always, I've, I hear quite regularly is, CSG said we can't do that. We never say that. Um, and I challenge, you know, anybody to say where we have said you can't do that. But it's often taken as um, the easy way out because otherwise you have to make a risk decision and that might go either way. Um, so it's quite easy to say, they said so. We don't make policy, we provide guidance to people that says, if you want to do this, these are the, you know, these are the risks, these are the, you know, these are the things that, that, that can happen. Um, 
And at the end of the day, if you follow our guidance, we'll stand with you and say you did the best you could, you know, at that particular time. A lot of organisations want to go beyond that, and we will try and help them, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to manage those risks above that. So it's quite a complicated, qu complicated question. Part of the work I'm involved with is how do we, how do we um, upscale a lot of the accreditors we have in government? Because accreditors are, a key, are some of the key people who make some of those risk decisions. Um, how can we make sure that, this, that, that we upskill them to the point where they understand the technology and, and some of the, the pros and cons of it? But at the end of the day, it's up to a department. The problem I have is I can't go to Apple and say, oh, can, can you get rid of those bugs? Can you, can you make your thing secure? A, you know, we are a tiny proportion of their customer base. Um, so all we can do is try and you know, use what comes out of the box. But what comes out of the box, as I've shown there, is not always... You know, not just the fact that there's, there's bugs in a lot of software, um, but they've actually got loads of features in them that means that you can compromise them easily. So that's the problem. So it's a really hard one. But at the end of the day, it's not for me to say, yeah, go use it. It's for the department to say, you know, what information are we using here? What sort of things can we do with the IT that we've got to make it better? But, I, I, you know, I absolutely agree that yes, a lot of the IT we have today is not terribly good and is not terribly... Um, um, sort of up to date, and a lot of that is, contra you know, but there are a number of reasons for it. Security is, an, you know, is is one of a number of areas that we need to consider. So it was a really long answer to that question. Anybody else? And I'll ask a really short, try and do it shorter. That gentleman there, and then that gentleman there, and then we'll call it a day. You showed a, a process chart uh, with a feedback loop to look at uh, incidents, and you mentioned the GSI, uh, you know, it's a potential area where it, where it could be shown. It, to me, there was something missing on that. That, that looked very reactive rather than proactive. And, and, and surely there must be some form of, uh, of, of predictive uh, ability that, that, that should be deployed in there to look at uh, big data, look at incidents internally and externally, taking information from the certs, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to predict what type of attack is likely to happen and, and head it off before it does rather than close the door after it's happened. Um, no, I wouldn't have said it was reactive at all. I'd say risk management is about understanding your environment, understanding where the risks are coming from, situation awareness. It's not just about looking at your network, but looking at the world around you, looking how policies change, how law changes, looking how um, new attacks are happening. And that's where, you know, we've got GovCert UK, which is part, part of GCHQ, part of CSG, um, and that's all about trying to keep an eye on what's going on and alerting people when new stuff is happening so people don't have to be looking at it all themselves. But absolutely, that it's, you know, for me, you know, we've got to do something to reduce the attack surface, and that's kind of the risk management and reducing the vulnerabilities. But you can only go so far with that. You know, you can, you know the only way you'll make yourself safe is you disconnect everything, and that's, un, you know, untenable. Um, once you've done the best you can in that area, and I say we've got a long way to go in how we do that better and more effective so we can use a lot of the new IT, um, it's all about being aware of your networks. Now, a lot of organizations I've spoken to, and I say, so how do you monitor your networks? What's going on in your networks? They don't even have the capability to do it, or it's outsourced, and the, the contract doesn't actually make them do anything. You know, the, 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 there's all, all those sorts of things. But it's a skill thing as well. You know, we don't have necessarily the right number of people with the right skills in the public sector, and we don't have the right skills in the private sector to be able to do a lot of this stuff, which is part of my you know, one of my challenges is how do we get more into this space? But it's a lot, you know, I can't create them overnight. I cannot clone them. I cannot nurture them in a greenhouse. I have to grow them through academia. And, you know, the kids coming through um, GCSEs and, you know, doing, doing engineering and things like that, I need to nurture them, get them through into a position where they're not cybersecurity experts necessarily, but they build good systems. They manage good systems. They configure good systems. They operate good systems. That's the key to what we do at the moment. A lot of the stuff that we end up getting involved in um, could be solved by good engineering, good software engineering, good testing, good configuration control. We got, got me going now. So we've got a group of pen testers, and our pen testers go out and look for vulnerabilities in systems with the systems owner's permission. Um, and they'll say, the first thing they say is, give us your system diagram. Show me, your ma you know, show me what your system looks like. So they give us big diagrams. So we can lay it up on the floor. And they go, right, we'll, we'll do that, and we'll do that. And then they go and look at the system, and it's completely different. So where was the engineering there? You know, basic engineering and you know, new connections have appeared and all sorts of things. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge and it's a long-term challenge. But we are starting, you know, we've done two years, I think, a national cybersecurity program. Um, already done some really good stuff with, with education, with, with academia, professionalization, but it ain't a quick fix. So that gentleman there, and then I'm going to run away. You said that 36% of... Um breaches are by human error. I wondered um, 
how inevitable it was you think that Britain is vulnerable to an Edward Snowden attack of some sort, and what checks you've taken to stop that happening? So it was um, Biz, I think's report that said 36%, and on the other part of that question, sorry, can't comment. So um, thank you all for um, listening. I hope that was useful. I hope you take some tools back with you. Um, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much.